Coming up on Chasing the Natty, a wild week two of the 2024 college fantasy football season is officially over, and we're here to make sure you're able to know how to move forward in your leagues. We'll be discussing how you should react to some disappointing performances from big-time players so far this season. We'll also talk about some big week two performers you should be avoiding on the waiver wire. And then, of course, we'll get to the best part. The players you should prioritize on the wire to make your teams better moving forward. We've got all of that and more coming right after this. This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everyone. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chasing the Natty podcast. Hope you guys are having a wonderful ride to your work on this Monday morning, we are the College Fantasy Football Podcast on the Campus of Canton Podcast Network. You can find us on all of your podcast feeds and on YouTube every Monday and Wednesday morning during the season at 6 a.m. sharp. If you want to support the great work we're doing here, head on over to campusofcanton.com. Subscribe there with any of our phenomenal tiers. We have content ranging on all sorts of college football games, whether it's CFF, Devi, C2C, College IDP, College GFS. Really, if you play it, we've got content. Whether that's tools, rankings, pretty much everything you need to succeed. If you want to get in touch for whatever reason, you can find me and the show on Twitter. Twitter. I'm at CFF underscore Jared. The show is at Chasing the Natty. And y'all, week two is officially in the books. Things are starting to settle out a little bit. You know, we had some big performances week one, maybe came back down to earth on here in week two. We're kind of starting to figure out, you know, who's legit, who's maybe not. Still quite a few questions up in the air, but definitely got a lot to look through today. As always, with these waiver wire shows and recap shows, We'll be hitting on the three main segments. First, we'll be hitting on the freakout list. Again, we're definitely still looking at a lot of the guys who were drafted highly, how we should be performing with them moving forward. Eventually, we'll kind of get into some guys that are more in-season performers. Um, And then, of course, I'll be hitting on uh, about five players that I think that you need to be avoiding on the waiver wire. To some people, I've, I've gotten this comment in my DMs a couple of times. Some people are saying like, oh, the people you name in that um waiver wire trap segment are usually just so obvious like why would you need to tell people that i'm like well not everybody again as 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 much as i as much as i appreciate all of you guys that you know listen year round a lot of you have been playing cff for the longest time not everybody really knows what to look for and i do think that some people do kind of fall into the trap of just seeing somebody with a big performance and then they just kind of run with that right and so again, some of the guys I'll mention today probably a little obvious to some of you, but for some, from for other people, definitely I think that um, definitely think that they you'll find some of the guys here I'll talk about enticing at first, and then you'll see why they're probably not the best plays to pick up there. There's one in particular that I'm thinking of a certain wide receiver that might be slightly controversial that I tell people not to go and pick him up given the offense that he's in, but you know we'll get to that here in just a second then of course all right right guys we'll be hitting on all of the waiver wire pickups that i think you actually should be going for and let me be real quarterbacks were hard this week uh wide receivers i actually had to add an extra spot uh for wide receivers this week because i couldn't narrow down who i really really wanted to talk about so all that being said man wild week two right again like a you know your top teams kind of having blowouts against lesser competition georgia ohio state texas taking down michigan in a big way um but also some really weird ones obviously Notre dame going down was a big one alabama um struggling with south florida again the second year in a row and again everybody's already made the joke but you know the that, that final score is not indicative of how that game went at all And then Oregon almost getting taken down by Boise, like legitimately almost getting taken down. That was not like a one of those games where you're looking at the final score and be like, oh wow, maybe that game wasn't as close as the final score intended. 
Nope. Nope. Uh, no, Oregon, Oregon legitimately almost lost to Boise State. Boise State, I think, is a legit player for the college football playoff this year. Uh, let's see, what other teams here? Tennessee just destroying NC State. I'm actually really, really worried about that NC State offense moving forward. Oklahoma struggling with Houston. Good Lord. Arkansas giving away the game to Oklahoma State. Kansas State having to survive Tulane. Like, wild, wild weekend this weekend. So, again, a lot to get to, a lot to react to. So, yeah, with all that being said, y'all, let's go ahead and get into this. Let's go ahead and start with our freak out list. Again, appreciate once again to our NIL tier members over at campusacant.com helping me narrow down who we will talk about on the freak out list each week. This week we're hitting up on we're hitting up on four different players this week. Initially, when I kind of gave the freak out list, I was trying to not have the same players on it each week, but this first player we'll talk about here was unanimously asked for in the NIL membership tier of our Discord, and so I will give the people what they want, and that is Gavin Sawchuk. Last week, I had him at a five. Nate and Chris were down at a two. The first week of the season, he had six carries, 15 yards against Temple. You're kind of able to chalk that up to, you know, blowout game. It's kind of the dice you roll early on in the season. Sometimes their best players get sad early especially running backs because you know you don't want to you don't want to wear and tear them on a team that you're about to beat by 50 but this week Oklahoma faces Houston and you might be thinking like oh maybe there's another blow nope Oklahoma barely beat Houston 16 to 12 in that game and quite frankly if there was a reason how do I say this basically like a game that close, if you're going to rely on Sawchuck as a key part of your offense, kind of like how Oklahoma was at the end of last year, this was the game to do it. This was the game to try to really get him going. I don't care if he had only 20 yards on the day. Like you should have, like if, if he's going to be a key part of your offense, you were going to get him 15 touches at least in this game. He had four carries for four yards in this game. That's it. This is a problem. This is a five-alarm fire for Gavin Sawchuk drafters. I have him at an eight. Chris K has him at an eight. Nate Marquise, the Oklahoma fan himself, has him at a nine, like borderline just getting ready to drop Gavin Sawchuk after two weeks here. Yeah, I'm fully on. You You cannot, you cannot in good conscience start Gavin Sawchuk at this point. I honestly don't blame you if you go ahead and drop him this week. Because this Oklahoma backfield has just become an absolute mess. His offense, in my opinion, is a bit of a... like. I think there's some big problems with this offense at the moment as well. But this backfield is just an like, absolute mosh pit right now. And what's even worse is that Javante Barnes, who we, you know, we had heard that the staff wanted to get him going a bit again this year, right? He had a very rough time last year. He had 12 carries in this game. Jackson all got four. So Gavin Sawchuk was the third option when it came to this rushing attack. Again, in a game that Oklahoma was struggling to score in. Now, granted, again, it's not like Sawchuk was sitting back there with four carries for 35 yards or something like that. We're all wondering why he's not getting the ball more. No, he was sucking too, right? Like he had, he's averaging one yard per carry. Not a great day for Sawchuk at all. Maybe there's some big problems here that we just don't really know about with Sawchuk. Maybe he's regressed from last season. But... Again, five alarm fire here. And like I said, just I think there's bigger problems with this Oklahoma offense in general. In this game, Jackson Arnold had only 5.4 yards per attempt. That's really, really bad for a former five-star quarterback playing in a Seth Luttrell offense. Like There is no reason why Oklahoma should have been that conservative with their offensive game plan unless they really do believe that there is issues with this offense. Passing attack is also top 10 in the power four in drop percentages. Again, Deion Burks was great last week. This week, not so much. He almost completely disappeared, it seems like. None of the other wide receivers are stepping up in the absence of, you know, Jaleel Farouk and Nick Anderson being out. The rushing attack sucks. The, the entire team averaged 2.8 yards per carry versus Houston. Again, I'll say that again. Houston, this is not... You know, an SEC team defense that you can like say like, oh, well, they got the talent. No, this is Houston, a former G5 program 
that has struggled mightily in the Big 12 the last couple of years. There's, a, there's big, big problems with Oklahoma in general, and Sawchuck's right there at the center of it. He's an 8 for me. We all got him at 8 or above on the freakout list. The other, another player that we want to throw up here is Will Pauling, wide receiver out of Wisconsin, a guy that I was drafting heavily in the third and fourth round range. I loved the idea of getting the Phil Longo wide receiver one in that position. And yeah, it's not been a good start. I just just straight up again against Wisconsin against uh, Western Michigan. He had six catches for 60 yards against South Dakota. He had four catches for 48 yards. So some of you might be surprised then to see that I only have him at a five. Chris K agrees with me. He has him at a five, which again, that's the look for a backup plan tier where again, if you're relying on Will Pauling, I do think that you should be prioritizing wide receiver on the waiver wire this week, just in case things don't get better. Nate Marquise has him at a three, just kind of monitoring him closely. And some of you might be very surprised by that. You're like, well, he, he hasn't eclipsed 100 yards. He's only had 10 targets in one game, right? But here's the thing. According to PFF, Will Pauling still has 18 targets on the season. He had 13 in week one, five last week. Obviously not a great trend there. But even still, that's 18 targets in two games. That's still on pace for 108 targets on the season. Well, that's not the elite 120 that I was kind of hoping for in the pace that he was at to finish last year. There's still room for a pretty good role here. Again, he's still the slot receiver in a Phil Longo offense. And as much as, you know, Luke Fickle said like, oh, we want to spread the ball around a little bit more. Maybe he did that this week. And how did that work out for you? You got Wisconsin didn't exactly look the greatest this past week against an FCS opponent. But again, week one, again, getting, getting Pauling 13 targets. I think the bigger problem for me right now is that Pauling just isn't playing as well, right? Again, partially, I think it might be Van Dyke, a quarterback, but also like Pauling's reception percentage is down from last year. Last year, he was bringing in 67% of his targets. This year, he's bringing in 55.6. Maybe that gets better, but I do think that's a pretty big part of what's kind of dragging him down right now. The other kind of main issue, and I, this is where I kind of agree with Nate Marquise when we were discussing it, is that like the bigger problem here might just be Wisconsin's passing attack and offense in general might have some problems, especially with the fact that Wisconsin seems to have almost no interest in getting their receivers any real love in the red zone. And I get it, right? You got a, you got a good amount of solid running backs you can work with. Tommy Walker, uh, first week, obviously he's out this week, but Ches Malusi and... So sorry, I just gotta I just gotta chuckle because speak, speaking of Wisconsin, Chris Moxley just texted her. Or never mind, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put that out there. But the Chris Mox and K know what what I just read. Um, anyway, um, but again, the problem is here they're not getting any of the receivers any love in the red zone, right? We've had five touchdowns from their running backs and only one combined touchdown among all their receiving options through two games that's kind of the bigger problem with wisconsin and kind of projecting will pauling moving forward so i got him out of five again i do think that there's going to be some problems with this offense moving forward that will keep will pauling from really reaching that fantasy ceiling that i really wanted to see out of him but i do think there's still some room for a bounce back here in the next couple of weeks if wisconsin continues to struggle and they realize like all right Let's put on our thinking cap again. Let's throw the ball to our best wide receiver again, and let's get some work going. So that's the first two. Let's see. Let's go ahead and move it on to our second uh, duo of guys here, two running backs that I want to discuss here. The first of which is Jalen White, the running back out of Georgia Southern. I got him at a six. Nate and Kay are not nearly as hot or worried as me. Nate's got him at a three. Kay's got him at a four. I got him at a six. So if I got Jalen White, I'm absolutely looking for a backup running back at this point. And the reason why I am so worried, and this should tell you a lot because I'm one of the captains of the Jalen White fan club. I've loved him for years. And I drafted a ton of him this offseason. So this is not coming from any place of malice or I told you so whatsoever. Like I am legitimately worried about Georgia Southern or, or Jalen White at Georgia Southern right now. The past two games 
for Jalen White, but against Boise State and Nevada. And in those games, he has averaged three yards per carry against Nevada and 3.2 yards per carry against Boise State. That's less than, again, so keeping track at home, that's less than 3.5 yards per rush. He hasn't played that poorly with that low of an efficiency since his game against James Madison in 2022. I'm willing to kind of overlook one bad game, but this is this is a bit of a trend here in addition to something else here that worries me. Like, he is not being very efficient this year. And like I said, that worries me. The other part is the fact that the reason why I was so okay with drafting Jalen White over and over again, why I've loved having him the last couple of years, is that when he is healthy, he is basically a lock in Clay Helton's offense for 20 to 25 touches per game. So far in 2024, he has gotten 15 touches and 9 touches, respectively. That's a huge drop-off from the last couple of years. And some of you might be saying, well, he had a good week one. Yeah, he had a good week one where he had three goal line carries in a game that Georgia Southern was forced to score 45 in, and they still lost, right? He's getting heavily, heavily boosted by those touchdowns and it completely obscures the fact that he has not had more than 35 rushing yards in either of his two games so far this is really really bad the jc french effect is quite real here as i mentioned before and i said this as as praise for jc french last year as a or last week as a cff option that french's intrigue comes from the fact that he's playing in a system that's going to force him to pass the ball in a absurd number of times and he can run the ball himself we're seeing that impact Jalen White here quite a bit like I said going from 25 to 20 20 to 25 locked in touches per week to now down to about 10 to 15 that's that's huge I'm worried about Jalen White moving forward I'm really hoping to see a good bounce back this week but if I can bench him in a league and I have a better option at running back or a flex I'm doing it the other and last member of the freakout list we'll be discussing here today is somebody that, quite frankly, a lot of us were ready to throw on the freakout list pretty much from week one. But here we are again. And that's Donovan Edwards running back out of Michigan. <sighs> again, we th- there was always talk about the fact that, you know, Donovan Edwards just isn't that good of a running back in general. He's had some really, really big games, but especially in the game like the national championship, got really lucky on certain plays and for the most part it's just not a player you can count on week to week and so far in 2024 that's just not what or that that's that's come to light again against fresno state 11 carries two points or 27 yards so 2.5 yards per rush against texas a little bit better here eight carries for 41 yards so five yards per rush as nate kind of pointed out when we were discussing this that that is an encouraging sign that you know he can have sustained efficiency there a little bit right but i really think that even if you're the biggest donovan edwards believer in the world right like you're sitting here saying like oh michigan's gonna turn to him michigan's gonna start getting him like you know 15 20 touches every single game like you just wait and see this passing game from michigan is going to kill everything defenses do not fear this this passing attack we saw it in the texas game last week we even really saw it in the fresno game they don't fear it and that's going to be a problem for the likes of donovan edwards and Kalo mullings right everything will be kept close to the line of scrimmage the boxes are going to be bigger and quite frankly donovan edwards is not the kind of running back that can make it through those big loaded boxes now he can he can find some wide open holes and take it to the house. And nobody's catching him. Fine. If you want to rely on that every single week, be my guess. But I don't think that's something that you can do. And then on top of everything else, Edwards isn't even the top running back for Michigan right now in opportunity or production. Kalel Mullings out carries him and out produces him by a full two point yards per carry. That is not good for Edwards moving forward again. Maybe things turn around for him, but right now I don't think there's any in any way. Shape or form, you can start Donovan Edwards. I would honestly be ready to make a backup plan and be ready to drop him after next week if, if nothing improves. So that's our freakout list. Again, if I wasn't clear, again, Donovan Edwards, seven or higher 
for all three of us. Nate's got him at seven. I got him at eight. Chris K, the Michigan fan, has him at a nine. So that should really tell you a lot about what kind of what kind of future we see for Donovan Edwards moving forward. So that's our freakout list. Let's go ahead and move on to our waiver wire traps of the week. Like I mentioned before, these are mostly guys that performed really well in week two. And some some people might be looking at them like, oh, maybe this is the start of something new. Like, you know, the start of High School Musical. Is it the start of something? No, no, I don't know where I'm going with that. Anyway, we'll start with Cade Klubnik, quarterback out of Clemson this past week against Appalachian State. Just took out some anger issues here. Good Lord. Uh 24 completions on 24 uh, on 26 attempts, so 92% completion percentage, 378 yards, 14.5 yards per attempt, five touchdowns through the air, also ran two times for five yards and two touchdowns. So stole two touchdowns there on the ground. Sorry, all Phil Maffa. <laughs> Sorry, Phil Maffa managers out there. You could have had three touchdowns this week, but nope, Kate Klubnik felt like stat padding this week and again i don't fully blame him club nick needed a win after after the performance against georgia and quite frankly just hasn't really had a huge game like this but that's also the point of why he's on the waiver wire traps this week looking at this stat line again 378 yards five touchdowns two touchdowns to the ground for those doing the math at home that's seven touchdowns from k club nick this past week is there anybody on this planet that truly believes that Club Nick will be repeating this or getting anything close to this? We've seen plenty of Club Nick. He has started for the last two, year and a half for Clemson. He had four games in 2021 or 2022, and he started all of last year. He's never had a game in four point passing touchdown leagues above 30 fantasy points. This is a complete anomaly for him. He's only had one game in his career where he's played above 10 yards per attempt like he did in this game, and that was in his first game ever against UNC, and that was the game that Clemson just absolutely walloped North Carolina in that ACC championship game there. And so everything about this just screams fluke. Again, 14.5 yards per attempt, that is not a reliable efficiency that you can rely on 92 percent completion percentage that's not happening again k klubnik i I have to check again but i don't think he's ever thrown above 350 yards in a game no i know for a fact he's never had five touchdowns in a single game like maybe Dabo just fully unleashes him i'm not relying on it at this point i don't think that this is something that you can absolutely expect at all out of klubnik moving forward i am avoiding completely i just think they happen to catch fire in this one game and then they'll be right back to the Clemson offense we've come to know over the last couple of years another quarterback here Joe Fagnana the quarterback out of UConn he had himself a monster day this past week uh you poor UConn very similar to Clemson actually he got absolutely hammered the week before by Maryland but to two to 50 to seven they took some anger out on poor Mary Mac here they win 76 or excuse me, 63 to 17. And Fagnana finishes the day with 42.92 fantasy points in uh, four point passing leagues. That is QB two on the week. He finished with 328 yards, five touchdowns for the year. Also ran five times to 38 yards and a touchdown there. Very similar to club Nick here. Everything's everything about this screams fluke to me. You're depending on some hyper-efficient passing here, right? He had 17.3 yards per attempt in this game on only 19 attempts. That's nuts. That is a absolutely bonkers efficiency there. UConn was in its bag this game for whatever reason. Where's this UConn the rest of the season? But that's also the main thing, right? This is UConn. UConn does not provide CFF options at quarterback. UConn does not score very often outside of games like this. Heck, the last time UConn scored six touchdowns in a single game was in October of 2019, so five years ago, against UMass. And the last time that a UConn player, a singular player, scored six touchdowns like Mr. Fagnana did here, that was David Pindle 
versus SMU in 2018. So, yeah, if you're out there and you're just scouring the top of, you know, who did the best last week and everything like that, and you see Fognano there at the top, mm -mm, don't do it. That UConn, that UConn quarterback room is going to hurt you. Sorry, uh, John Lobb out there. Uh, I don't mean to hate on your Huskies, but I got, I got to put this man down. All right, next up here, we got Justice Ellison running back out of Indiana. Very, very simple here, right? Again, it's another running back. Had himself a really nice week this past week. Nine carries, 117 yards, two touchdowns. Indiana was just beaten up on poor Western Illinois here. Uh, to the tune of 77-3. I believe they set a school record for the most points scored in a single game. And as you can tell with Ellison's efficiency here, 13 yards per rush, that they were just completely outclassed. And we've seen two weeks in a row that Ellison's touches are pretty capped right here in this 9 to 11 range. That's not going to be a CFF option that you're going to want to deal with on a week in and week out basis. And even still, even if you want to believe that, you know, kind of like the way Sean Parker uh, stands of the world, if, if you want to believe that, you know, he's going to rip a big one every single game here, right? Like, Ellison's not even RB1 on his own team. Right, he's behind Tyson Lawton. Elijah Green's kind of creeping up on them. He's he's definitely a tier behind them in terms of opportunity. But man, he's been super efficient the first couple of weeks here, and so don't don't go after Justice Ellison. I don't care if he scored twenty three or almost twenty four fantasy points this past week. Next one here, this one I think might be the most controversial among my four. Maybe Cade Klubnik. Some there's there's still a few Cade Klubnik stands out there, um, but. Chris Dawn, wide receiver out of Texas State. This is one, I think, even among the people who kind of know what to look for, for the most part, I think this is going to be a tempting one, given the fact that, you know, it is Texas State's offense. We love, we love G.J. Kenny's offense here, right? And you see a wide receiver rip off 150 and two touchdowns in a single game you're sitting there wondering like oh boy we got our next big guy here especially chris dawn again he's a true sophomore this year so you're sitting there thinking like all right here's the year two jump right here i don't think you i i think dawn's gonna have more big plays and potentially more big games down the stretch i don't think it's gonna be something you can expect every single week he got six targets this past week reeled in five of them again 150 yards two touchdowns the week before Three targets, two receptions, 13 yards. This, that was kind of my first clue of like, okay. UTSA was locking down Hobart and Wilson, and they let Dawn kind of leak out here, right? They couldn't cover all the dudes in this offense, which credits to G.J. Kinney in this offense for being able to do that. But that's not going to be something that every defense is going to be able to do. Like I said, he had three targets in week one. If you go and look at to this point in the season, he's not even wide receiver three among all of the guys here. I mean, obviously, Hobart and Wilson are your wide receiver one and two, but really 1A, 1B in terms of what they've been able to do so far. Obviously, Hobart's got the two touchdowns and, you know, more efficiency there. But Jaden Williams out targets Chris Dawn. He also out snaps uh, Chris Dawn as well. So. I would say that if, if you really want to take a shot on a guy in this offense that's not Hobart or Wilson, I would honestly pick up Jaden Williams before I pick up Chris Dawn because at least Jaden Williams is going to outsnap Chris Dawn by just being that other outside wide receiver for this Texas State offense, right? So if, when you have three wide receivers on the field, it's going to be Williams out there, not Dawn. Dawn only comes in when they do their four wide receiver sets, which granted with G.J. Kinney, they do quite often. Don't get me wrong. But even still, I think Chris Dawn is going to be tempting. You see a guy in a system that we love, I wouldn't do it. Last one here of the waiver wire traps I'm going to throw out here is Mr. Dante Wright, wide receiver out of Temple. Had himself a phenomenal game this past week. 15 targets, 11 receptions, 101 yards, and a touchdown. I'm basically going to go back to the well on this one again. Don't buy fully into this again just look at his week you might be saying like well jared he had the game against oklahoma the week before only five targets 36 yards like you can't hold that against him you're right i can't hold that against him i can hold all of last season against him though where 
his highest yardage in a single game came in week one against Akron, where he got 71 yards. Yeah, he has some, some high-volume games here. Again, started off 12 targets in week one, 12 targets week two. A couple weeks wait, later in week, I believe it's six there. Yes, six. He had 10 targets against UTSA. Guess what? Never broke 100 yards. Never had a multiple touchdown game. You know why? Because Temple stinks. Temple's a really, really bad team. And their quarterback situation is even worse than it was last year. So good on Wright for having a really good game here, breaking the 100-yard mark in this game. But that's not something I'm going to rely on him moving forward. So avoid Dante Wright. Avoid Chris Don, Avoid Justice Ellison. Avoid Joe Fagnano. And avoid Cade Klubnik. So... All that being said, let me take a sip of water and then we'll be right to y'all's favorite part and that's the players that you should be targeting on the waiver wire. All right, let's do this. So I'm going to be real with you guys. If you're looking for quarterback help this week, I don't think this is the week for it, at least not for right now. I think you're going to be left wanting because the guys I'm going to bring up to you here, at least these first two, are really going to be guys that feel more like just safer plug plays that you can plug in. Like, you know, your main quarterback is out with a bye or maybe goes down to injury. These guys kind of patch up your teams because they're solid, you know, 25 to 30 point guys. But they're not going to be in offenses or really situations that are going to make them hit you know those potential 35 40 45 point weeks and so we'll start off the first one here and that is mr eli holsting this is probably the one i feel the best about again him and the other acc quarterback that i'll mention you're probably in my opinion a tier above pretty much everybody else that you can grab largely off the waiver wire this week so with holsting here I was impressed with his week one debut and I was even more impressed with what he was able to do last week after Pitt goes down early in the game against Cincinnati. He's able to bring them back all the way. I believe, oh my goodness, let's see. Let's see if I can find that game real quick. Yep, that's all top 25 guys. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I can't remember, I can't remember how far down. I think it was like 20, I think it was 27, 27 to yeah, 27 to 6 at one point I believe it was regardless it doesn't really matter at the end of the day he, like Holstein performed well in this game again 35 passing attempts 302 yards 3 touchdowns also ran a little bit 10 rushing attempts 36 yards if you take the sack yardage out of it you know he hit 50 rushing yards on the ground there and the thing that kind of makes this interesting is that Pitt made a offensive coordinator higher over the off season that I don't want to say it flew under the radar because like it's a lot some of us in the CFF community noted it the deal was that even though we kind of liked the hire and that was Cade Bell the former offensive coordinator of Western Carolina the CFF community myself included was kind of largely dismissive of the hire because Pat Narduzzi's kind of known to hold back his OCs and not really let them fully run their offense but Given what we've seen the first two weeks of the season, doesn't seem like that's the case for Bell. It seems like Narduzzi really has kind of taken his hands off the wheels here and is letting Bell kind of run his stuff, especially, you know, with Bell bringing in, you know, Desmond Reed and everything. He knows he knows the players pretty well, kind of brought in Holstein to fit into that mold. It seems to be working out pretty well so far. Like I mentioned, Holstein in four-point passing, um... League so far has hit 25 plus points in each of his matchups. That's a really, really nice floor. And again, it's two different types of matchups, right? One was again against an FCS opponent. This past week was a shootout. Shootout. Not really, just more of a competitive game with the likes of Cincinnati. He's hit uh, 300 plus passing yards in both of the games here. I actually see a potential, a potential higher ceiling with him, given the fact that. You know, we, we've we seen him use his legs, but we know for a fact he can use his legs even more than that. So I think there's a potential for some monster games, especially once he kind of gets into the teeth of his ACC schedule. But for now, I think he is a perfectly fine pers- uh, player to grab as, you know, 
a potential stopgap if your quarterback goes down or you need to plug him in for a week with, with your quarterbacks on bye soon here. So I like Holstein moving forward. I'm excited to see what that offense looks like as the year goes on, as they kind of get better and better. I think he'll be a ton of fun. He's got some nice matchups coming up as well. West Virginia this week, an FCS opponent the week after that. He should be in for some good ones. So Next up, we have Anthony Calandrea, quarterback out of Virginia, rostered in 22% of leagues here. And kind of similar to Holstein, I think you can find some potential value here with another quarterback that could potentially get into quite a few shootouts here in the ACC, especially with the way that Calandria um, plays here. Calandria last year was kind of a favorite among CFF players, not because you know he himself was a valuable asset for CFF, but because as a true freshman, all he did was feed Malik Washington and Malachi Fields over and over and over again. And he, not only that, he'd constantly chuck it to them deep. And guess what? He's doing the same thing again this year. He is the perfect... Yeah, like the perfect like screw it quarterback where he is constantly throwing it deep constantly just trying to hit that big play over and over and over again and it makes for some really really interesting matchups here again over the last couple of weeks we've seen him have some really nice games here one against an fcs opponent in week one there i believe it was richmond where he got 25 points uh th- or th- 30 points actually and then this week in a more competitive matchup again it's nice to see him perform well in both blowouts and also competitive matchups right here this past week he passed 43 times for 357 yards and three touchdowns also ran a little bit on the ground 13 attempts for 23 yards i think that if we're going to see in if in competitive matchups we're going to see Calandria hit as high as 40 pass attempts in a single game given the way he plays i do think there's quite a bit a potential for Calandria to have even more CFF relevance down the stretch here. Like I said, last two weeks, he's thrown for 297 plus in each of his matchups. Um, I like the schedule coming up here. You got Maryland next week, who just got done with its own shootout with, or not, not complete shootout, but you know, its own competitive game there with Michigan state. Um, they got coastal Carolina the week after that, they should be able to perform well in that game. We know that Virginia's running game is pretty inconsistent. So, Calandria is going to be called on a few times down the stretch in order to play hero ball, which is going to lead to some pretty high CFF weeks. So, I like Calandria. Again, are they, are any are him or Holstein really as high as some of the quarterbacks I was talking about last week? No. I wouldn't really be dropping a ton of guys that are probably already rostered for the likes of Holstein and Calandria. More so just, you know, if your quarterback room is just in complete shambles right now and you need some guys to kind of provide some safe floors. I think Calandria and Holocene are both looking good for that. Next up here, this one I feel weird about putting, but I feel like it's also a, a player I can't not put, considering that he kind of had a record-setting day yesterday, and that's DJ Lagway, quarterback out of Florida, rostered in 26% of leagues. That is almost exclusively, from what I can tell, um, dynasty leagues where he's owned in every single one of those and i don't think there's a ton of people have run to the waiver wire and redraft leagues to go ahead and grab him he had himself a really nice day yesterday granted it was against sanford but you know sorry florida fans but sanford's sanford's giving you a run for your money before so this is a this is a pretty big improvement here um yeah 25 passing attempts complete 18 of them 456 passing yards and three touchdowns. Also ran a little bit five five rushing attempts for sixteen yards. Um, yeah, I feel weird about putting this on here because I was literally just done. I just got done poo pooing the likes of K. Klubnik and Joe Fognano for you know having hyper efficient weeks, and here I am praising DJ Lagway for having eighteen point two yards per attempt, which is obviously not at all sustainable here. But regardless, you have a five-star freshman here starting for Florida. For a lot of people, he's either the first or the second highest ranked quarterback for this class. He lit up the scoreboard in his first in his first start here. He looked really, really good. And to give you an idea of just how good, he was only about 28 yards short of Florida's all-time single-game passing record. Um, 
I'm not. I'm. I'm not gonna say he is a must add. Like I said, like Colsey and Calandria are like a tier above everybody else here. I do think Lagway is an interesting add if you want to just kind of shoot for upside. Because one, I know we know for a fact he can move. Again, he had five rushing attempts, sixteen yards. We know he can do better than that. So even though I do believe that his eighteen point two yards per attempt will regress, obviously week in week out, once he you know starts playing real competition here. I do think that he can kind of make up for that with a little bit more rushing here. But, again, part of the other reason why I don't want to say he's a must-add is, in case anybody forgot, Florida does have the toughest schedule in all of the country, and they just got done with what was supposed to be the easy part, right? This week, he's got Texas A&M. The week after, he's got Mississippi State, then he's got a bye, and then he really gets into the teeth of his schedule there we've already seen lagway what he looked like against miami granted you know he was being thrown out there as a backup can't fully judge him for how he performed in that scenario but at the same time right it is a little indicative of what he looks like against me power four competition compared to you know beating up on a poor fcs opponent here and so i'll need i long story short i think lagway is an interesting ad if you really really want to I personally need to see more before I fully buy in, but I'm throwing them out here just in case. Last quarterback that I'm really going to highlight here, and it's somebody that you know we've talked about a lot during the offseason. That's Matthew Sluka, the quarterback at a UNLV, rostered on 24% of his rosters. You might be asking, why am I talking about him? Well, that's why, and that's because he's owned in so few leagues there. I will say, <laughs> I did a lot of defending of Matthew Sluka and his ability to pass the ball during the offseason because, you know, I pointed out that his efficiency numbers were pretty solid, his completion percentage downfield pretty solid. UNLV coaching staff highly disagrees with me considering the fact that he passed for his season high of 161 passing yards in this absolute beatdown of Utah Tech yesterday. And he did throw three touchdowns, I think all three to Ricky White, the thing that really makes Sluka interesting, right, is his dual threat ability, right? He ran for over 1,000 yards last year against Holy Cross. This year, he's already on pace for rushing for 774 rushing yards. He's going to run the ball quite a bit. And that's where you can kind of make up for... That's where you kind of make up for the lack of passing, right? He only passed 17 times this past week. But with his rushing, he was still able to finish out the day with 31.44 fantasy points and four point passing touchdown league so his rushing is always going to give him a safe floor i think if he's available in your league and you need a safe floor with the potential to go absolutely nuts some weeks on the ground i think sluke is your guy move on to honorable mention the quarterback like i mentioned the, the the quarterbacks this week are very weak in my opinion i think maybe if i had to add one more maybe i go hank bachmeyer out of wake forest but even then i'm not super excited about that i'll throw two honorable mentions here that are not really ads more just i'm keeping my eye on them one is skylar locklear the quarterback out of utep the transfer backup quarterback from austin p followed a uh, scotty walden over here from austin p and he's performed pretty solid um to start the season again obviously week one against nebraska there's only so much you can do about that but this past week against uh, Southern Utah, Grandin FCS program, 29 attempts, 295 yards and a touchdown. He also ran quite a bit, 15 rushing attempts for 47 yards and a touchdown. I think that given the way that UTEP's roster is shaping up right now, given the level of competition that UTEP will be playing at in this USA, I do think there's going to be quite a few weeks where Locklear might be interesting for starting and so I'm going to keep my eye on him over the next couple of weeks and then the other one was the guy that I was a little surprised by how well I thought he did this past week and that is Caden Samoza the quarterback out of Ball State granted again against some FCS competition that they were losing to at first it, it is it is it is um, Missouri State here but in this game again Samoza passed 39 times uh, for 262 and four touchdowns. He also ran a little bit, six rushing attempts, 16 yards, another touchdown on the ground. I'm, again, a, a quarterback in the MAC that, you know, has a little bit of rushing upside, potentially could be throwing 40 plus times in a game. 
I'll keep my eye on it just in case to see if that goes anywhere. But for right now, again, definitely not Samoza nor Locklear really adds. It's definitely guys I'm adding onto my watch list over the next couple of weeks. So that's our quarterbacks. Let's move on to our running backs. All right, a significant tier jump in the type of players that we'll be discussing with running backs compared to quarterbacks. You will notice I'll be much more excited about these guys moving forward here. And that is the first one up here is Braden Sloan, the running back out of Ball State, currently rostered in 5% of leagues. This past week against Missouri State, he had 21 carries for 103 yards and a touchdown. He also caught six balls for 46 yards and an additional touchdown last week or again yes anyway um got to give a shout out to justin leo aka volume pigs and my buddy mitch hart at a souls rule on twitter for being really the two guys that were earlier on sloan than pretty much anybody i had seen uh for those of you who don't know Braden sloan is a fcs transfer he was at eastern kentucky last year uh, where he put up 765 yards on 143 rushing attempts on the ground. He also had an additional 40, I repeat, 40 catches last year for 467 yards. He had 13 touchdowns combined. I think he had 10 on the ground, 3 through the air. Ball State, since they lost Carson Steele, has really needed a new bell cow to really kind of have this offense run through and after the marquez cooper experiment really failed this past year i think they found their guy in Braden sloan sloan did come in as a late enrollee so i was skeptical that he climbed the depth chart that quickly but given what we saw this last week again what is it 27 touches for sloan this past week i seems like i was pretty wrong to ever doubt him so granted with all this being said, again, this was against Missouri State's defense, but I will say I don't think this that's necessarily as much of a knock against, you know, MAC teams as it would be against, you know, a Power 4 player. So I think the important thing to really take away from here is, one, this game was competitive for quite a bit, and so Ball State did have to kind of get in their bag a little bit and force, and they were forced to play like they would normally play against, you know, upcoming competition. And... The fact that that includes getting Sloan the ball this many times is a huge, huge screaming indicator that Sloan is a future bell cow back here in the MAC. And if Sloan can be anywhere close to what Carson Steele was just a few years ago, Sloan might be the most valuable waiver wire ad this week. Another pretty important waiver wire ad this week has to be Mr. Caleb Johnson, the running back out of Iowa, rostered in 30% of rosters right there at my... I was, I was glad he's like right there at my threshold. This past week, 25 rushing attempts for 187 yards and two touchdowns. Also caught the ball three times for nine yards against Iowa State. Boy, Caleb Johnson, man, you were disappointing last year, brother. Man, are you coming back with a vengeance? We did start this year with uh, Kamari Malton, kind of surprising everybody, the true sophomore there at Iowa, like sitting atop the week one depth chart. And then in week one, Bolton did not do extremely well. He didn't really do extremely well this past week either. Meanwhile, Caleb Johnson is just quickly becoming back to the man we thought he would be in Iowa City in his freshman year, right? Where he, in his fr true freshman year, he was able to take over that backfield. Really, really well. We in the CFL community kind of knew that there was a possibility with, you know, Tim Lester taking over as the offensive coordinator that there would be a possibility of CFF relevant back here with the Hawkeyes, given the fact that, you know, he had a pretty extensive history of top RB production at Western Michigan. You know, think you're Sean Tyler's, think you're Levante Bellamy's, for those of you, remember, those of you who remember those names. The problem was that we just didn't really know who this would end up being, right? Between Johnson, LaShawn Williams was taken over at times last year, and then Kamari Moulton is at the top of the depth chart all of a sudden. Well, it's pretty clear here after two weeks that Johnson's emphatically made his case. Um, and by emphatically making his case, I mean he's leaving the rest of his backfield just straight up in the dust. On 36 rushing attempts, Johnson is already north of 306 yards and four touchdowns. He's averaging 8.5 yards per carry. 
in last week's game, like I said, he, he officially overtook Moulton as that RB1. He got 25 carries against them. If this is what we can expect from Johnson down the road, I do think CFF players are absolutely going to want to get as much of it as they can. The one note I will add about Johnson, though, is that with Iowa's offense, even with Tim Lester now as the offensive coordinator, just because of the style, the players, their personnel they have, and also the conference they play in, the games are going to be lower scoring. The way Iowa plays with their tough defense, they're going to not have as many scoring opportunities. And so that is going to limit Johnson's ceiling week to week just a little bit. But if the last two weeks are any indication, it doesn't matter if Iowa scores only two touchdowns. There's a very good chance that Johnson will be the primary choice in order to get those two touchdowns. So got a nice matchup against Troy this week. Then they get right into the teeth of the Big Big Ten schedule there. We'll see how that goes for Johnson moving forward. Next running back I want to throw out here is Damon Claiborne. Uh, Claiborne, the Claymore explosive guy here, running back at a Wake Forest. 22% rostered in Fantrax fan leagues. Hell must be freezing over because if I couldn't believe my lying eyes, it seems like Dave Clawson is actually properly utilizing talent at running back. Wow, he must have really, really learned his lesson after Kenneth Walker's departure a few years ago, only to go on and become a Heisman contender at Michigan State. So, but in addition to that, like, I think it's also possible that, you know, after seeing that poor quarterback play last year, will completely kill this offense if Clawson doesn't rely on a top running back. I think he's learning his lesson there. Because so far through the first two season for first two weeks, excuse me, of the season, Claiborne is averaging 19 touches per game, which quite frankly is just a minor miracle for a Dave Clawson running back. I think it's pretty clear that Claiborne, given what we've seen so far, I mean last week again, 21 carries, 86 yards, two touchdowns on the ground. He's gonna be a pretty major part of this offense moving forward. Even if the quarterbacks are improved from last year, like I kind of mentioned earlier, Bachmeyer looking pretty solid the first couple of weeks here. I was worried at first that, you know, Claiborne would fade if Bachmeyer started to kind of put up those numbers again. Dave Clawson would go back to what he wanted to do. But based on, you know, the week two game against Virginia, right, Bachmeyer could be pretty successful through the air, and there's still room for Claiborne here, right? Like Bachmeyer. Being successful actually might help Claiborne by kind of lightening lightning the box there, right? Wake Forest does have some tough matchups kind of coming up. You got Ole Miss this week in week three. Then you got a bye. And then there in the middle of October, you got Clemson. But really outside of those, you should be able to start Claiborne most weeks. Again, do I think he has the ceiling of some of the other banks on a week-to-week basis? Probably not. But I do think that he has a very, very high floor Given the conference he's in, given his role in this offense, I like Claiborne moving forward quite a bit. Next up is Mr. Javon Jackson, the running back at a UTEP, a guy that I liked quite a bit during this offseason. We got the first real look at what UTEP's offense is going to be looking like moving forward. Again, you don't you can only take so much away from getting beaten down by Nebraska 50 to 7. So we saw UTEP this past week in a competitive game against uh, South Utah where, you know, they end up losing. But like I said, we got to see like the first real look of what this offense might be looking at. Like, how are the carries being divvied up? Who are the main guys? And clearly, Javon Jackson is going to pick up his role that he left off there at Austin P. Like I mentioned, Javon Jackson is following Scotty Waldman from Austin P. They basically picked up and brought that whole offense over here with them. Jackson this past week, 20 rushing attempts, 80 yards. He also got four receptions for 22 yards and a touchdown there, finishing the week with 18.2 fantasy points. If Jackson is going to repeat what he did last year, I think there's no way he could be sitting on waiver wires at this point. Again, last year again at Austin P, 252 rushing attempts, 1,373 yards, 10 touchdowns on the ground there. Again, there is a bit of a jump here you know, from FCS to FBS, but it's also the, C- the CUSA. I'm not entirely expecting that to be a massive, massive jump from the FCS level. I would like to see Jackson obviously improve on the 4.0 yards per rush this past week. 
But I think he'll have opportunity to do so. And again, if you just look at the schedule moving forward, again, their their top 20 easiest schedule in the group of five here. You got Liberty this next upcoming week. That should be a pretty high scoring game that they could take advantage of. They got Colorado State the, the week after. That's never been a hard defense really to get around. I think that Jackson's in for a really good couple of weeks here. And like I said, hopefully, hopefully the O-line kind of improves. Hopefully Jackson improves his efficiency here. And he should be in for a good amount of work over the next couple of weeks. So, last running back here that I'm going to bring up, I'm not going to throw him up just yet, because I want to point out that the next running back, as well as several of the honorable mentions, are all in the same category for me. And I, I, I'm, I'm dubbing these guys potential committee busters, right? These are situations where... You know, either so far this year the backfields look like a committee, or historically the staff there has run a committee, but suddenly in a more competitive environment this week, it seems like they're turning more to one guy. And that's where you can potentially find some value here in the early weeks of the season, where, you know, guys look like, you know, th- this is really what we were hoping would happen with, you know, the likes of Gavin Sawchuk and what kind of did happen with Abu Sama this past week, where even though Abu Saba didn't have a great performance, right? In a competitive game against Iowa, Abu Sama was getting all the workload compared to, you know, an FCS program where they split everything up. So there's a bunch of these guys this week, actually. And so, like, I, I've chosen Henry Parrish, the running back at Ole Miss, to be the official play out of this bunch. But I think really him and the rest of the honorable mentions I'll kind of mention here are guys that all fall into that same category and all carry the same level of risk here, right? I think that it's very possible with all of these guys that maybe we're reading a bit too much into this. And last week was just hot hand situations for all of those committees. That's very common with a lot of these committee situations. But with some of them, it's particularly with Harris, I think that if he is the number one back going forward, you can't afford not to take that risk and let somebody else in your league potentially grab up the RB1 for Ole Miss. As I kind of mentioned, right? Like, Lane Kiffin's not afraid of having a bell cow back. He had one at FAU. He had one at Ole Miss, obviously, with Quinshawn Judkins for two years there. Lane also went out of his way to pull Parrish back out of Miami to come back to Ole Miss. And so, clearly... Lane likes what he sees in Parrish. Clearly, he knows that Parrish knows this offense really, really well. And so if Parrish continues to do like he did last week, where, you know, 14 rushing attempts, 165 yards, four touchdowns, that's the kind of performance that could potentially earn him more trust of the staff moving forward here. And so I do think it's important to know that, right, like Parrish, as good as last, like, last week was, like, He's clearly a step down from Quinchon Judkins, so I don't think you should be grabbing him expecting, you know, that, you know, locked in top 20 CFF production, right? But I do think that, you know, there's there's definitely a path to him having a really solid, solid year moving forward. I would also point out that he is not really built to be a bell cow. I know in college, things like that don't matter as much, but he is five foot 10, 185 yards or 185 pounds. So, again, especially in the SEC, that's not really a build that's made to take 20, 25 touches per game. What Parrish does have it going for him, though, is that he is a pretty solid receiving back compared to a lot of the other guys on the roster. So that'll help him out a little bit. And so, like I said, I think Parrish, if he is the number one running back for Ole Miss, it's going to be hard to pass him up, really. And again, we'll definitely find out in the next couple of weeks. Ole Miss should be able to take care of Wake Forest pretty well. George Southern, Kentucky, those are the next three matchups for Parrish. So if he, if he does it again next week, you're going to love having Parrish over the next couple of weeks. So that's why I made him the official play. But with that being said, I'll go ahead and move into our honorable mentions here. of a bunch of other guys that kind of fall into the same category, right? The first one here being uh, Rajay Harris, the running back out of East Carolina. What you also notice, at least with two of these guys, is that they are veterans of their program. So that kind of plays into their favor a little bit. Harris rostered 6% of rosters. Week one against Norfolk, six carries, 24 yards, one catch, six yards, basically nothing out of Harris. This next week, 
in a hyper competitive game against Old Dominion where the final score was 20 to 14. Harris was heavily relied upon. 26 carries, 131 yards, two touchdowns on the day, five yards per carry. Again, no promises that that keeps up, given the fact that, you know they have guys like Marlon Gunn, Javis Bond back there, but I can't ignore the fact that he had that much volume in a single game, especially a hyper-competitive game like this, where the staff said, all right, Harris, we're relying on you moving forward. So with all of these guys, with, with Parrish, Harris, uh, Dante Dowdle, and Michael Bernardo, go ahead and say their names as the guys that I'll, I'll be looking at here as well. With all of these guys, I don't think any of them are guys I would grab and start this week. Definitely guys I would grab, see what they do on your bench, drop them after a week if they go back to what they did before, or maybe you can play them again the next week. So, like I said, very similar situations with Dante Daddle out of Nebraska. He had eight carries in week one. I think potentially he earned more carries the next week because, again, he had eight carries for 55 yards, so almost seven yards per carry and a touchdown there. Against Colorado, they're very reliant about on him. 17 carries, 76 yards, or 74 yards, excuse me, and two touchdowns on the ground. Granted, again, Colorado's defense, although Colorado's defense does actually look pretty improved from last year. See, I don't always hate on Colorado. I can admit when I think they something looks good. Um... But regardless, like I think Dante Dattle, given the four-star pedigree that he used to have, right, a lot of the other running backs at Nebraska have been guys that we've kind of waited to do something for the last couple of years, but they never really made that big jump. Dattle definitely has the potential out of those four guys, and I think Dattle currently is riding that potential moving forward. And then Michael Bernard, right? This is a guy that Utah went out of their way to bring back out of the portal, and again, Last year was a committee against Southern Utah to start this year. It looked like it was going to be a committee. He had five carries, 33 yards in that game. And then this next week against Baylor, with Cam Rising going down, unfortunately, out of this game, this staff turned to Brian Bernard and said, all right, you're the guy this offense runs through now. And with that, Bernard got 19 carries, 118 yards, no or no touchdowns on the ground. He also had two catches for five yards and a touchdown in in that game regardless that right there is 21 touches for michael bernard i don't think we've seen a utah running back get that in quite some time and so i'm hoping that potentially utah now has their kyle whittingham rb1 of old with michael bernard again so we'll have to see moving forward and then the last honorable mention here is not a guy that falls into the category above but Seth McGowan, which, by the way, how many of you remember where he used to play? It's Oklahoma, by the way, if you, if you didn't know. He, he's been missing for a couple of years, but he's hanging out in New Mexico State, and man, he's, he's, he's doing really well for himself. Again, week one against Southeast Missouri, he had 11 carries for 86, 87 yards and two touchdowns. This is, by the way, again, a New Mexico State offense that has not been very good, really outside of McGowan. And then this next week against Liberty... McGowan had 15 carries, 76 yards, and uh, no touchdowns on the ground, but he did have three receptions for 25 yards and a touchdown. I'm not saying grab him and start him, but I can't ignore the fact that he's had two weeks in a row of 17-plus fantasy points here. He doesn't really have the volume I'd love to see, but, you know, he got 18 carries against Liberty last week. They'll be playing a CUSA conference schedule throughout most of the rest of the year. Should be a lot of competitive games that... You know, he won't be game scripted out. Even if he was game scripted out, right? Like, caught three balls yesterday. So, he's a pretty solid receiver. So, I think that, you know, I'm keeping an eye on Seth McGowan there at New Mexico State. We'll see how that goes in the next couple of weeks. All right. Let's keep this moving. Let's head on over to the wide receivers here. And, once again, kind of similar to last week, I think there's a lot of really good options for you to look at. And, really, a lot of guys, depending on your play style of CFF, I think there's really something here for everybody and so let me take a sip of water and then we'll get right to it all right first guy that we'll bring up here is mr trebor pena the wide receiver out of syracuse roster on 26 percent of rosters a lot of you a lot he he already had a pretty big jump his roster ship percentage last week so clearly a lot of you guys were on him already i kind of mentioned him as an honorable mention last week and not to pat myself too much on the back but i did tell people that 
Syracuse's wide receivers were somewhere to look when it came to hidden CFF value. Now, admittedly, I did champion Zeed Haynes, who's off to a pretty slow start so far this year. Granny's he's also banged up a little bit. But I also did champion one Trebor Pena. Like, I, I saw so many practice reports and so many interviews with Kyle McCord where when they asked him, like, all right, who, who are you connecting with? Like, Pena was the name that kept coming up, and he plays in the slot. You have a first-time offensive coordinator here. What's the easiest position in all of football to scheme open? The slot. And so that's why you see in so many in so many systems the slot receiver being the guy that gets heavily targeted. And boy, Pena is off to a really, really solid start. He got three touchdowns again in the game against Ohio. Then all he did was follow that up with another two touchdowns against Georgia Tech this past week. What's even more exciting is the fact that Payne is not just getting his work through the air. Um, oh my gosh, I blanked there. Not only is he getting his work through the air, but he's also getting work on the ground. Again, against Ohio, he had three, um, he had three rushes, I believe, on a jet sweep um, into the end zone. He also had another rushing attempt this past week. So this is a guy that, again, this offensive coordinator, uh, Jeff Nixon, is trying to get him the ball in pretty creative ways. Now, as phenomenal as his first couple of weeks have been here with five touchdowns for the first three weeks, I would like to see his target his target numbers kind of go up a little bit. Again, seven targets per game, something to sneeze at, but I would say that I would like to see more because, again, I like his efficiency so far, but, you know, that doesn't last forever. Volume is something that can kind of keep you more consistent week to week. However... Pena hasn't hasn't stopped so far, and they do have a really, really nice schedule moving forward. They have the ninth easiest schedule in the Power 4 moving forward, according to our numbers from C2C Winning Edge, which means if Pena continues to do what he has been doing, I don't think that Pena is going to be leaving your lineup for the rest of, your, rest of the season. So good luck to Pena. He is on bye this week, but then his next opponents are Stanford and an FCS opponent. So like I said, I don't think he leaves your lineup moving forward if you grab him next wide receiver i have here is the the partner in crime of da- my, my man damon ward whose performance i am still still tweaking a bit from this past week and he had four targets one reception 16 yards i again you know who didn't disappoint this past week mr dt sheffield right here um While many like myself were gushing over Damon Ward's just phenomenal week one performance last week, DC Sheffield kind of had himself a pretty solid game as well. He saw saw 10 targets for 7 catches in 74 yards last week. He didn't score any touchdowns, but regardless, like in, in Damon Ward's shadow last week, Sheffield had himself a pretty solid week as well. He only followed it up this week with another 11 targets, pulling in 6 of them. For 74 yards again. This time he gets three touchdowns. So. I do believe that. Moving forward. There is room for two. Two options. In this offense. Again I'm a big Damon Ward fan. Obviously I've been championing him all offseason. I was victory lapping him last week. The CFF gods humbled me greatly this week. With Ward's unfortunate performance here. Um. I, but again, I, th- I think Sheffield's your clear number two for this offense, even with the return of true sophomore Landon Sides. Historically, the slot wide receiver has just not been a priority for Eric Morris's offense. You've typically seen the two outside wide receivers get the most love out of the offense. However, I do think we are looking at a pretty good exception this year. Well, many remember, like some, some or, or excuse me, some of y'all may remember that D.T. Sheffield last year initially committed to Washington State coming out of community college. Well, that was back when Eric Morris, the current head coach of North Texas, was the offensive coordinator for Wazoo. But after things didn't work out at at Wazoo, you know, Eric Morris became the head coach at North Texas. D.T. Sheffield quit the team after like two weeks. He transferred over to North Texas to the guy that he initially committed to. And clearly, Morris made it a priority to bring it to bring Sheffield to his team, not once, 
but twice. And we're kind of clearly seeing why here. Morris knew that he knew how to utilize Sheffield, and we're seeing the good returns here. And so I like Sheffield moving forward quite a bit. I had uh, my buddy Austin ask me earlier today, like, all right, who's the wide receiver one between Sheffield and Ward? Like, who's the better CFF option? I frankly, guys, this is quite possibly our Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas. If this offense truly gets going and, you know, Ward returns to form, Sheffield continues to do what he's done over the last two weeks, probably get a bit more um, bit more explosive performances, there's a good possibility that, you know, Ward and Sheffield are this year's Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas, and we're looking at potentially two top 20 CFF wide receivers on the same offense moving forward, especially, especially with the schedule that North Texas has moving forward. Lots of great shootouts. I believe the game that North Texas and Texas Tech have this week, the over-unders already been put out at 69. So yeah, lots to look forward there. Moving on here, another wide receiver that I want to throw out here is Mr. Treyon Sibley, the wide receiver out of Liberty, currently rostered on 26% of rosters. Last week, he had eight targets, five receptions, 155 yards, did not find the end zone. But for those of you who have been looking at this Liberty offense all offseason, you know the value that Sibley is possibly going to give you down the stretch. If you've been looking for the C.J. Daniels replacement, I believe we found him with Trey Sibley. Liberty as a team hasn't gotten off to a very hot start so far, but one clear bright spot has been Sibley's emergence as the top option for Kadon Salter after losing C.J. Daniels, who is off at LSU, doing pretty decently over there so far. Sibling ha- or Sibley has quickly slid into Daniels's role here. He's averaging 26.4 yards per catch. He's hit 100 yards in each of the first two games of the season. To this point, he's seen 13 targets for 264 yards and a touchdown. So some of you might be wondering, though, Jared, like you normally knock uh, wide receivers with high efficiency on relatively low target volume. After all, like 26.4 yards per catch on only 6.5 yards per target isn't my usual cup of tea. And to that, I say you are 100 percent right. But you guys also know that I am quite fond of my systems and my patterns that I notice in offenses and different roles that I see. And like I said, CJ Daniels, his role is being filled by Sibley. CJ Daniels last year, 19.3 yards per catch, 5.9 yards per target targets per game. Guess what? Daniels still hit a thousand yards and Daniels still managed to be a CFF relevant option most weeks. So long as kid on Salter and his offense kept that efficiency. So if Sibley's going to have a repeat of last year, then he's a fantastic grab off of waiver wires right now. Next wide receiver up here is Mr. Mac Delena, the wide receiver out of Fresno State, rostered on 2% of rosters right now. Last week against Sacramento State, 9 targets, 7 catches, 235 yards, and a touchdown. Just a monster game. He also got a rushing attempt for 18 yards. So... Just a great all-around performance for Mac Delane. I believe he finished in the top 10 wide receivers for CFF. Finished with 34.8 fantasy points in half PPR formats here. A lot of us this offseason got our hands on Jalen Moss. And for good reason, right? He was He's clearly been the best wide receiver at Fresno State the last couple of years. And, you know, there's a possibility of him playing in the slot, which is where we know the value in this offense typically comes from. And we spent a lot of time on who would potentially get that, right? But it turns out the chase for the slot wide receiver might have been a bit of a wild goose chase, right? Because currently, Jalen Moss plays on the outside. He's been solid so far this year. And Magdalena here has also performed really solid to start the year. And he also plays on the outside. The guy who does play slot, real and sharp, has 12 less targets than either Delena or Moss to this season. Typically, I'm a systems guy, right? I try to follow systems. I try to find patterns year after year with different guys. Sometimes coaches, as much as they like their system, they just like to trust their veterans. 
And I think it's pretty clear that's what Fresno State plans on doing this year, right? Between Moss, between Delana, both of them are averaging nine targets a game. And quite frankly, I think both of them would have even more production than they do at this point in the season if they didn't have to play Michigan week one. Moss is already owned on most leagues right now. Delana, if you miss out on your chance to get Moss and potential great production from Fresno State this year as soon as they get into play, I think Mac Delana is your second chance here. The rest of their schedule is a cakewalk. Even the date with UCLA to finish the season doesn't even really scare me, given the fact that Hawaii had success against UCLA at home. And so I think Delaney is a great pickup moving forward in the season. Next wide receiver up, we got two more wide receivers I want to talk about here. And the next guy I got up here is Mr. Donovan Green, wide receiver out of Wake Forest. Currently, Nate Marquise is the happiest slice of cheddar out there with Donovan Green finally being CFF relevant moving forward. I actually think I I think two years ago I did actually have Donovan Green as a wave wire option. That didn't really work out very well back then. So maybe we we have a second chance here. Regardless, Green had himself a phenomenal game this past week. Uh, 16 targets, 11 catches, 166 yards, and a touchdown. Had himself a nice game the week before as well. Poor Green has been out for the season two of the last three years. Uh, we got a small glimpse of him in 2022 when after he came back from his first injury. And during that year, he averaged 17.4 yards per catch. 17.4 yards per catch, which led the team that year. So clearly, again, big play guy waiting to happen. We also know that Dave Clawson's wide receiver ones have been absolute magic for CFF over time. Think of your A.T. Perry, Ja'Kiri Robertson, Sage Sherrods, Greg Dorch. The list goes on. And quite frankly, like I'm kind of surprised at the fact that we as a CFF community did not target Green or more Taylor Moore and really more this offseason, I know we were kind of butthurt from last year, last year when the Wake Forest offense kind of completely fell apart. But even so, again, the fact that we came into the season, Green's only rostered in 12% of leagues right now, kind of blows my mind a little bit. And that's on me too as well. I don't hear what I'm not saying. I should have been on Green more uh, this offseason. I should have probably had him higher. So that leads to the question though, right? Like, is Green that guy this year? Is he... You know, the A.T. Perry is the Sage Sherrod's top outside wide receiver for Dave Clawson. I kind of have my skepticism a little bit. He did only have four targets in game one. However, he, like I said, he did get 16 targets this past week in the game against Virginia. As I kind of mentioned with the running backs, Wake Forest blew out their previous opponent. No real need to get Green a ton of targets. It is important to note, who does Wake Forest go to in a close game here against Virginia? Well, they went to Green over and over and over again. The first game was also Green's first game back. It's quite possible they were trying to slow play him, realize, hey, looks pretty dang good. Let's let's make him the focal point moving forward. And so I think that Green's worth a waiver ad moving forward. Again, there's a tiny bit of skepticism in the back of my head, but I'm going to push that aside for right now. Uh, he plays on the outside, which is where Sage Run and A.T. Perry did their damage, so I think he'll be fine moving forward. Um, it kind of is a bonus. I do think Taylor Morin's kind of interesting, considering the fact that he's gotten 16 targets through the first two games. He got six versus North Carolina A&T, got 10 last week versus Virginia. However, one, I do think Taylor Morin's a pretty known quantity at this point. Like, the last couple of years, he's range in that 60 70 target range i think he ends there again this year maybe he hits 75 80 potentially but regardless like he's not the he's not going to be the number one guy there's still room for a true number one guy and i do think green can fill that role pretty well number two hank bachmeyer is actually pretty playing pretty well to this point in the season and if he continues that i do think there's room for both Morin and green to have their good weeks back and forth in this offense so We'll see what they can do. Again, like I mentioned earlier, they got they got Ole Miss this week. Then you got a bye. I think you're probably going to have to wait a little bit to truly know what you're getting out of Green over the next couple of weeks, but we'll see. The last wide receiver that I'm really going to prop up here is Kanata Mumfield, the wide receiver out of Pittsburgh. Uh, rostered on 16% of rosters. Um, 
Last week against Cincinnati, eight targets, five catches, 123 yards, and two touchdowns. Um, for those of us who got uh, who chased after Kenny Johnson after last week, I did admittedly, although I didn't make him, uh, I didn't make him an official play last week. I did chase after him in a couple of dynasty leagues because he is a younger guy. Um, for those of us who did go after Kenny Johnson, we were greatly bamboozled. Good lord, what a drop off! A point, I think he had four rushing yards. Last week against Cincinnati, I, I need to go back and double check the um, first game from Pitt and to see like when exactly Johnson was pulling in all of those um, pulling in all those balls because I have a feeling that maybe he got um, I have a feeling that maybe he got um, not garbage time but like you know he's part of that second wave of part of that second wave of receivers that Pitt put out there. Let me see. Let me actually check something real quick. Yeah, th- this should have been a red flag. Uh, Kenny Johnson, um, Kenny Johnson only had fi- has fifty eight or sixty one pass snaps compared to Raphael Williams and Kanata Mumfield. So that that should have been a red flag for me last week. Regardless, we're we're fixing we're fixing this now. Kanata Mumfield's your guy for Pitt moving forward. As 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 enticing as Kenny Johnson was last week, Kanata Mumfield is clearly the guy. He has sixteen targets to this point in the season. Uh, like I said, this past week, 123 yards, two touchdowns. He has the most pass snaps among all wide receivers outside of Raphael Williams. And regardless, he is clearly the top guy. He has a very healthy split between he has a very healthy split between uh, slot and out wide, which means again, Pitts moving him all around the field. And it's pretty clear that, you know, last week. Pitt was down big in this game. They were down 27 to 6. And he and Holstein really seemed to find a connection in the second half here in that come from behind victory. That's the kind of stuff that really makes a quarterback more dependent on you moving forward. And so I really like what we can see out of Konata Mumfield moving forward. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier with Holstein, Pitt's schedule is really nice moving forward. Um, you got West Virginia this week and FCS opponent the week after. Got a couple of tough ACC matchups here and there, but regardless, Pitt should be fine most weeks, especially if that offense continues to cook. So I'm willing to grab Kanata Mumfield in a ton of my leagues. All right, let's head up these honorable mentions really, really quickly. Uh, first one here is Luke Floria, wide receiver at a Kent State roster in four percent of leagues. He's had himself a really nice stretch the last couple of weeks. Eleven targets in the game against Pitt, eight targets in the game against St. Francis. Um, you know, ninety-two yards, one hundred four yards, touchdown in each of those games. Honestly, again, he might be one of the safer plays right now, and he's made me real nervous about some of my Christian McCray shares right now. now. But granted, Kent State might also have just enough to enough passing to go around to feature both of those guys. Um, Theo Weiss is a guy I threw on here. He's rostered twenty four percent of leagues, but when I threw him on here, it was with the potential in mind that you know Luther Burden exited the game early against Missouri, but apparently that was more sickness than injury. And so I put I put I put Weiss on here as a potential big option if you know Luther Burden was out for any games or anything like that because you know Theo Weiss in this game against Buffalo yesterday 14 targets 13 receptions 149 yards so without burden on the field Weiss clearly became the number one guy something to keep in mind if you have a deeper league maybe you if and you if you have burden maybe you grab Weiss as a potential handcuff there another guy here that I have my eye on is Andrew Armstrong the wide receiver of Arkansas played in his first game of the season he was out week one and boy did he announce himself to the world uh, 13 targets, 10 receptions, 164 yards, uh, no touchdowns in the game. But regardless, that's a very hefty target share to start the week off there. I'm not making him an official play, but if he does this again next week, I think he'll have to be an official play given the fact that, you know, just the volume is pretty incredible there. Uh, Dalen Cobb is another one I want to throw out here. Again, out of Georgia Southern, 15% rostered in fan tracks leagues. He has been very consistent the first couple of weeks here. Again, about seven to eight targets each game, about 50 to 80 yards, and a touchdown in each of them. He is playing in that Caleb Hood role. and that, So that tells me that if this passing attack continues to get better as the season goes on, as J.C. French gets more comfortable as the starting quarterback, Cobb's probably going to get relied on more and more as the season goes on. If I could pull up 
the Georgia Southern target distribution so far. Yeah, he's currently second on the team. Obviously, Derwin Burgess is number one there with 19 targets. But if you look at Der Derwin Burgess, he is, boy, oh boy, he is he is having a rough time of it right now. 19 targets, but only nine receptions. That's less than half his catches. Meanwhile, Cobb is currently the more reliable guy. Again, he has a 73% uh, reception percentage. So if you want a safe guy who's going to be stuck in a lot of potential Sunbelt shootouts, I think Dalen Cobb as... You know, the partner in crime for J.C. French makes a lot of sense. Last one I'm going to throw out here. This this goes against all of my process, but I do want to keep an eye on him a little bit. And that's Skylar Bell, the wide receiver out of UConn, formerly of Wisconsin. Last two weeks, he had seven targets for five receptions, 141 yards against Maryland, which is pretty solid. Again, going up against, you know, power four competition there. And then last week against Mary Mack, he only had two targets, two receptions, but 105 yards and a touchdown. Bell is clearly, at least through the first two weeks here, clearly the best wide receiver that UConn has. And UConn will be playing behind from behind a lot. And Bell is a power four level wide receiver. I'm kind of surprised he ended up here at UConn. So far, he has shown that he was not somebody to be overlooked in the transfer portal here. Again, he's got eight targets on the year, 246 yards. The next closest receiving option for UConn is actually their running back, Cameron Edwards, and that's only because he ripped off a huge one. If you want to go receivers, um, Ezariah Anderson is the number two wide receiver. He has 54 yards receiving versus Skylar Bell's 246. So I think Bell's going to get more work moving forward. I'm not adding him. I am watchlisting him. So keep an eye out for Bell moving forward. All right, we're going we're gonna to run through these tight ends real quick. One, because we're running out of time here. But two, nobody really excites me this week. Again, Tanner Cozio is probably the best one here. I am hesitant to put his name out there because that means I have to admit that Chris K might be right about one of his guys. And quite frankly, I feel dirty doing that. Uh, no, I'm kidding. K's, K's awesome. You absolutely should listen to him. Um, but even more, more importantly... Um, I, I was on the Quizio ride last year. I loved him as his true freshman season. He was top 12 in CFF 2022, right? Despite missing two games, I was ready to see him take off again last year. And he returned my investment with a tight end 46 finish with only three touchdowns on the year. So needless to say, I was a little butthurt. He's also a nice start this year. He had seven targets in game one, pulling in six of them for six, six yards and a touchdown. It is rare to find a tight end with that kind of volume, especially one where you kind of know he'll have that volume week in and week out. It'll be a focal point of this passing attack. But I will say, be warned, Cozio did start off really, really hot last year before fading pretty hard in the second half. And so... You know, could could be in for a repeat season, but, you know, out of the tight ends, like, there's really not much better options out there for you to grab right now. Speaking of not much better options, I will say I'm intrigued by Gunnar Helm at the tight end out of Texas. Nice nice weekend this past weekend. Seven receptions, 98 yards, and a touchdown. A lot of us have been wondering, like, wh when did Gunnar Helm become this receiving option for Texas? Like, we, we were really big in on Amari Nightblack, who might even be tight end three for Texas right now, which, woof. Regardless, like Helm, for most of his career, was a guy that was, you know, out there. He's a really good pass blocker, really, really good run blocker, right? That was his deal. But now, this year for Texas, he is actually catching the ball quite a bit more. So, if that's the case, then we have a potential, you know, Jatavian Sanders situation here. Hard not to go, go and grab Gunnar Helm just to see what he can do. And then the last tight end here I'll talk about is Alex Bowman the tight end out of Tulane, rostering 7% of leagues here. Again, volume, not the greatest. Only eight targets over the first two games. But man, oh man, does Mensa really, really like Bowman as a red zone target because he's got three touchdowns through his first two games. And given, you know, a young quarterback, best friend is his tight end. We saw the target numbers go up from two to six this past week. I have a feeling that Bowman's going to get more and more work as the season goes on. And I think he's a pretty solid add for your tight end if your tight ends are just completely crap in the bed right now. So, all that being said, appreciate all of you guys for, for listening. 
we've come to the end of our show. If you have not already, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching this on the YouTube side of things. If you're on the podcast side of things, make sure you leave the show a five-star review wherever you can. Make sure you're following the show as well. Make sure you guys check out the rest of the Campus of Canton Podcast Network for shows ranging on pretty much anything you can think of related to the college fantasy game. Be sure to also check out the campusofcanton.com and the tons of articles that we are putting out on a weekly basis. Again, I put out my waiver wire article for CFF reasons every week. Felix Sharp puts out his own waiver wire article for C to C purposes, and so like if you're if you're looking for like a C to C centric waiver wire article, he puts that out every single week. Um, you know, Chris K and Ethan Sowers are doing a phenomenal job with the DFS content every single week. Uh, Nate Marquise is putting out his C- Pulse of the CFF Nation article every single week. There's just tons to read over there, so make sure you go check out all of that. With all that being said, we'll see you guys back here on Wednesday when we preview week three of college football. Until then, really appreciate you guys, and I hope you guys have a wonderful and blessed week. See y'all.